The very wealthy Bill Gates was once asked through a forum on the internet known as Ask Me Anything. Do you think being a billionaire has made you a happier person than if you were just a middle class person? Okay, so just anyone can ask these questions on the Ask Me Anything. I don't know who it was. Someone asked this question. And isn't that a question that many people want to know the answer to? If I just had more money, if I just had a lot of money, like so much money I didn't have to think about anything, I'd be happier. I wonder if it's often because we think we would worry less if we had a lot of money. Seems that we instinctively think that way. And in other words, if, if we have more money, we simply won't worry about things, right? Bill Gates' response was, yes, I don't I don't have to think about health costs or college costs. Being free from worry about financial things is a real blessing. That's his quote. So he essentially said, yes, money has made me more happy because I don't have to worry about certain things. Money doesn't solve every problem. It does solve some, doesn't it? Steve Siebold researched more than 1,200 self-made millionaires. He found that the wealthy aren't afraid to admit that money can solve most problems. Siebold writes, and here's his quote, the rich see money as a positive tool that has the power to create freedom and opportunity for themselves and their families. After all, if you have a problem and you can make it disappear by writing a check, you don't have a problem. End of his quote. So if we pursue wealth and achieve it, and we don't have to worry about food and clothing and many other life problems, what have we truly gained? A worry-free life that doesn't have any bearing on our future and eternity? A worry-free life in a sense, but there are still a lot of things out of your control. We live in A strange time, don't we? The coronavirus pandemic. And no matter how much money Bill Gates has, if the Lord chose to take him home through whatever means, whether through coronavirus or something else, take him home, end his life, however you want to look at that. Uh, I don't know if he's a Christian or not, so I, I shouldn't speak home. But don't we still have something to worry about? Even if he had all that money? So I titled today's message, Worry, What Is It Good For? And it might make you think of a song, and yes, I'm going that direction. We'll answer that in a minute, though, or a little bit later. I want to give you today, this is a little different for me. I like three points, a poem, and we go home. That's, that's what I like. But I have ten points today. <laughs> Calm down, they're not going to be the normal li- length of post. It will be a little shorter, Okay. Uh, I want to start with actually seven, kind of be a little bit intermixed actually, but seven, and you have your list there in your bulletin if you're following along, there's seven reasons not to worry that we see in our text today, and we're going to have three ways to win the battle against worry that we're going to talk about today. The main points are the three ways to win the battle, but I didn't want you to miss the reasons not to worry because that's what Jesus describes here as we continue in this message of Jesus giving a message, the Sermon on the Mount. And, and we come to this point here that it's just really helpful to understand that why we worry and why we don't need to worry. But knowing that alone may not be enough to stop us from worrying, so we want to learn how to think. So we're going to bounce around here. I'll try to make sure you understand where I'm at, but let's read the text together. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34 is where we're going to read. I'm just going to read it all together all at once here real quick. He says, this is Jesus continuing on. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. 
If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you? You of little faith. So, don't worry, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. All right, let me give you our first reason not to worry, and we're going to backtrack a little bit. I know, I just, this is not a normal sermon. Number one, because worry is idolatry. It is, it is choosing to worship another God or serve another God other than the one true God. Jesus starts this paragraph with a therefore and a command to not worry. So he is building on this previous statement, telling us that because of that, do this. That's what he's saying. And when he says this, this command, don't worry about your life, he's referring back to the cause of that is verse 24. Let's read that real quick. It was just a part of it. No one can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters because you're going to either love one and hate the other, but you can't serve both God and money. There's, there's no middle ground on this. You're going to love one, hate the other, choose one, neglect the other. It just It doesn't work. Think about it this way. If we serve God, then all that we have is his. We're a servant of God, so these are mere resources for God to use in our lives and in others around us. It's his to decide, ours to steward. We hold our possessions with an open hand. We employ our resources in his service. It's it's why we give to the church. It's why we give to the missionaries that we support. It's why we give to Christian camps and the general advancement of God's kingdom. It's why we do those things. And in doing so, we store treasure in heaven, and that's where our hearts are if we put our treasure there, as Brian talked about last week. But we'll keep moving here. But if you serve money, on the other hand, think about this. This is what it looks like if you serve God. But if you serve money or the pursuit of wealth, then God and his instructions are subject to our desires. Think about that. If we choose money, if that's our pursuit, I want to be wealthy and because we can't do that and God, doesn't mean you can't be wealthy, it just means pursuing it in our hearts as, the, as our master. You know, most of us don't put it in terms like that. But we're either going to ignore God altogether or maybe worse, we'll even ask or demand from him to help us get wealthy. Kind of like a genie in a bottle that is required to answer our wishes. Of course, God is not truly subject to anyone or anything, but it is how we act when wealth or the pursuit of money is our master. I just say this. This kind of threw me off a little bit. I'm like, I don't really do that. Say this just out loud, okay? And I want you to taste how how awful it is in your own. Oh, hopefully you taste awful. Anyway, say this. Money is my master. I don't want you to mean it. Just say it. Yeah, I hear a lot of mumbling under those masks. You're like, oh, this is a trick. I mean, I gotcha. No, I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that. Say it one more time. Money is my master. Does that make you sick? This is kind of like, money is my master. But how many times do we actually function as if money is our master instead of God? Shouldn't be that way for Christians. And those that pursue money and wealth, we usually think that We master money, but the reality is it masters us. And many people have dedicated themselves to this little g, God, God of money. So wealth becomes an idol or God. So beginning to win the battle against worry, we'll go to our first point. You're going to skip the other six for now, and you're going to go to the next column or next, you know, the next section there. Serve God single-mindedly. We gotta serve God single-mindedly. When you choose a master and it's determined and it's done, you don't have to keep going back to it and decide, well, who's my master gonna be? 
Now, we might have to keep realigning things to be that, but we're not going through the question of, well, do I really want to serve God, or do I want to chase things in this life, or God, or life? It, then you start weighing the things that come in and the decisions that you make as, okay, God is my master. How does that fit? How do I align that with what he wants? We've got to decide that. Because being divided probably causes as much stress and worry as if we just chose to pursue wealth altogether, which comes with its own weight of worry. And being a Christian and following God can lead us down some paths that would terrify people, terrify any one of us. But yet we have a God who will faithfully walk with us through it. So the foundation of this main command is built on one having their mind made up about who, whom we are serving. Is our mind made up about who we're serving? Let's look at verse 25 again where Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? So we see the command, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about your life. Let's define worry briefly. I've got a definition for you here. It is this, worry is having ongoing, right? so moments of anxiety, it's not necessarily what we're talking about here, but ongoing anxious concern based on fear of possible danger or misfortune. So hasn't happened, might happen, might not happen, but we go through this whole anxious concern in an ongoing way because of a fear, a perception of what might happen. I think that's one of the, a good simple definition of worry. And what we find is our minds and our bodies go into overdrive trying to protect and, and we overthink how do we, can, how do we control this situation so it's not so fearful and frightening. We stress about the bad things that might happen. But Jesus expects that by God's grace we can choose to not worry. He gives us reasons to not worry. And, and here Jesus focuses on basic life needs, food, drink, and clothing. But isn't that the funny thing that the, it's the basic driving force? You know, when, when Bill Gates answered that question, I don't have to worry about where my food's coming from tomorrow. I've got plenty of money to buy it. He didn't have to worry about losing his job in the, in the pandemic because he's got enough money. Even if he lost his job, he could survive. And isn't that what a lot of us have longed for and hungered for? Because it? it's security that we long for. And we think money will produce that. But he asks a very important question, Jesus does here, and he proceeds to answer it. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? So we see our second reason to not worry found in verse 26. 26 says, consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? So he goes to birds, and so our second reason not to worry is this. Because the one who gave life will also provide food. The one who gave life will also provide food. Which is more important? Food that keeps life going or, or life? Like, do we forget how amazing of a gift life is that God gave us? And if he gave us that life, won't he also make sure there's food for it to sustain us and keep us going? God takes credit for feeding even the birds, the created order. Birds work, but they don't act in human ways of sowing, reaping, and storing up. You know, we all have this, we've all heard this expression, right? The early bird gets the, yeah, right? Well, this, birds are a great picture of this. They work, but they don't store, and yet God feeds them. Birds do by nature what God created them to do, be birds. And God provides their basic need for food regularly. And he asks that rhetorical question, aren't you worth more than they? Aren't you worth more than they? And the resounding, obvious answer that is not answered in the text is, duh, or, or yes, whichever you prefer. God gave life to the birds, and he cares for their needs and, and knows how to maintain that life. And how much more will he care for humans who have the gift of the breath of life from God, who have the gift of being made in his image? That's significant. Now, the God who gifted you life will also provide for keeping you alive. If we remember that, then we ask these questions. Do you want to be fully committed to God? 
devoted to God in your life, and maybe you're wondering, why haven't I been able to do that? Why have I struggled with that? Maybe we should examine how much effort and worry we put into our life needs and the pursuit of money and wealth to meet those and the security that we pursue instead of trusting God to meet those needs. Now, this is not an encouragement to not work. There's biblical instruction for why we should work and be faithful and to be good stewards and save and store up. But we shouldn't be worried about it. Let's skip verse 27 for a second and come back to it. Verses 28 through 30 reveal our third and fourth reasons why we should not worry. So let's read 28 through 30 again. He says, And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? Our third reason not to worry is because the one who gave a body will also clothe you, will clothe that body. Again, which is greater, the body that he created and gifted to you or the clothes that you need to cover it? Clearly the body's more important and he's going to help clothe it. If he gave the body, he'll also clothe it. So again, the resounding rhetorical answer or question, I said that wrong, the resounding answer to the rhetorical question is, duh. You're welcome to say yes if you, you know, if that's just too rude, but. You know me. This time, though, instead of birds, he talks about wildflowers. He tells us to observe wildflowers, to look at them and see what, what, what they're about. Notice these flowers don't labor or spin thread, so they're a little different than birds. Labor in the field is usually a reference for men out working in the fields so they can earn money to feed their families, to buy fabric for their wives to make clothes, to spin the thread to make clothes for the family. These flowers don't do either of those things. They don't work. And we in Scouts Valley know some beautiful flowers, don't we? Unlike birds who work but don't worry, flowers don't even work at all. And they don't worry. Again, it doesn't call for laziness or not to work or not to save or not to plan. We see scripture talk about that in other places and I won't spend the time on that today. But listen to this, they're adorned, these flowers of the field, the wildflowers, are adorned more beautifully than Solomon. The wisest, wealthiest king that Israel had ever known was Solomon. And I mean wealthy. I mean to today's standards, inflation included, Solomon was a wealthy guy. Very wealthy guy. And, and Solomon liked nice things. He was the benchmark of having nice things. Nice clothes, being well-dressed. And yet, Jesus says that these flowers, these little flowers are adorned and dressed more beautifully than Solomon even dreamed about. And who's responsible for how these flowers look, how they're dressed, how they're adorned? God. Not from their own labor or effort, not from their own storing up. They just are. This beautiful picture of God's value of something that seems so minute. Because he talks about clothing the grass of the field with the flowers. So you look at the grass, and even less important than the flowers is grass. It's here today, gone tomorrow. Oh my goodness, I never believed how weak grass could be until I came to Washington. If you get two sunny days in a row above 70 degrees, grass turns brown, dries up, and dies. It's crazy. Texas, man, grass is green till it's like 100 degrees for 30 days. You know, it's different. It's just, I don't know why I get into that weird comparison. Focusing here. God is so good. And his creative goodness and diversity with just the flowers should tell us how much more he's going to care for us and our needs. And did you notice that little, that little itty bitty tag at the very end of this verse? You of little faith. Sad how true this is of all of us. But that leads us to our fourth reason not to worry. Because worry is unbelief. Worry is unbelief. Ultimately when we worry, 
we're expressing that we don't trust God. We don't trust him to meet our needs. We don't trust that he is good. We think that God doesn't care, and we function as if God doesn't exist, which is why Robert Mounts describes this as practical atheism. We say we believe God, we say we're followers of Christ, and yet we, we so often function in this fear and doubt that God is going to be good, and we worry. We show our unbelief through our worry. You'll glance at verse 32 and you'll see that it it reminds us that your heavenly Father knows you need these things. We've heard Jesus express his care for birds and his creative adorning of flowers, but we're still tempted to doubt that God knows or cares about our own needs, no matter what they are. And when we worry, we're acting in unbelief. So how do we start to win that battle? So jump down to the next section again. Number two, for winning the battle against worry, trust God's good character. The opposite of unbelief is faith, it's trust, it's believing God. We've got to make a choice to believe that God, is, that God is, first of all, that he is, that he's good, that he will reward those who diligently seek him. Believe that God is good, that he means what he says when he's going to care for the bird, so he'll also how much more care for you. Will there be times that it's hard to believe? Yes. Yeah, it's going to be hard to believe sometimes. It it wouldn't be faith if we could always see what we're supposed to believe. the, The definition of faith is that we are trusting in something or someone that we cannot see at the moment. That's faith. Many times in seasons of life require that we choose to believe in God and his good character even when it's hard to believe. All right, let's go back to the verse we skipped, verse 27. For our fifth reason not to worry. Verse 27 tells us, can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? What a great question. Uh, Number five is this, because worry is powerless to help you. (laughs) Worry is powerless to help you. And that's the point Jesus is making, asking this question, which is kind of like, it's kind of like, can you smell the color nine kind of question? Because he kind of mixes like, can you add a height to time? It's strange, but it's the point that he's making is, look, metaphorically speaking, you can't even add a minute to your life. You can't add an inch to your height. Whatever it is you want, you, want to, you can't. Worry is powerless to help you. The reason we pursue wealth often is basically to meet our physical needs in a ways we don't have to depend on God or anyone else. And Jesus' point is that we pursue, what we pursue won't provide what we really long for if we're pursuing wealth. Because ultimately we can't control our life and we can't avoid death. A lot of wealthy people have lived on this planet. A lot of wealthy people have died on this planet. Statistics prove five out of five people die. Just saying. (laughs) We may worry about making money and, and so we have plenty of food and drink. Maybe we were able to store up a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of money with a huge bank account, but all that storage won't extend our life one moment. Can't trade it with God for a moment, not even a moment. Worry is powerless to help you. But does worry have power? I'd argue it has a little bit of power, but it's negative power. It has the power to be harmful. Quick Google search. This is not the greatest of uh, research skills, but I went to WebMD is what came up. WebMD says there are about 40 million Americans, American adults specifically, who are affected by anxiety disorders each year. That's about 18% of the adult population. And how many more go undiagnosed because they're never treated? Health issues that WebMD says are associated with worry. Ready for the list of side effects of of that wonderful drug? (laughs) It's kind of like that. But these are just, these are effects of worry. Suppression of the immune system. Isn't that great during a pandemic? If I worry about getting sick, 
my immune system actually goes weaker, so I'm more likely to get sick. Huh. Digestive disorders, muscle tension, short-term memory loss, premature coronary artery disease, heart attack, stroke. I actually added the stroke. I think that's one of them. Anyway, wow. Number six, the, the sixth point we're here. We're going to read in verses 31 and 32. Jesus says, so don't worry. So don't worry. I said as a command, don't worry about your life. I'm going to remind you, so don't worry. Saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. So number six is because you were different from unbelievers. Gentiles is a word here. It's actually the Greek word for ethnos. In other words, peoples. It's actually not the typical word for Gentiles, but it is communicating those that are not part of God's family, those that aren't trusting in God. So all others, so Gentiles is a great word for that, all others eagerly seek after these other things. They look forward to the next deal, the next purchase, the big numbers in their bank accounts, not worrying about problems because money can handle those problems. Those who aren't in a relationship with God Almighty pursue these things eagerly and we Christ followers ought to be different according to our master Jesus and if we serve Christ then money and wealth will not be our master we trust him to meet our needs not our effort to produce wealth verse 34 has our seventh and final reason not to worry so we're skipping 33 we'll come back to it Verse 34 says, therefore, <laughs> we've got so many therefore, so remember, here it is again, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Are you getting what Jesus is saying here? Are you picking up what he's putting down? Don't worry. Therefore, because of all this, don't worry about Tomorrow. Because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And so our seventh and final reason not to worry from just today's text is this. Worry steals. It's a thief. Worry steals from God's grace for today. If we could sum up all of the reasons to not worry, this one, this one nails it. Because Jesus' conclusion of this topic is to not worry about tomorrow. If we have, most of us probably have food enough for today. In our, in our cupboards, we maybe have food enough for like a month. When we start worrying about what's going to happen, what if I lose my job, what if this, what if that. But we, it steals, worry steals from God's grace. And I love that he says tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That's a word for evil, for bad, for wickedness, for troubles, difficulties, whatever it is that's not good, things that we would worry about. He's like each day has enough troubles of its own. He doesn't say, don't worry, follow Christ, follow me, and, and your life will be worry-free. No. He doesn't say your life is going to be trouble-free just says don't worry don't worry depend on God daily seek him daily he provides the grace that we need to endure and even thrive in the middle of troubles so brothers and sisters church don't steal from today's grace to deal with tomorrow's problems God's grace is sufficient for today and tomorrow, when we get there, and tomorrow is today, his grace is sufficient. You ever wonder why God didn't give the Israelites manna for a week at a time? Or a month at a time? He gave it to them how often? Daily. Except for one day, where they gave him two. Today is plenty to put our attention towards. Tomorrow's fears may never happen. And yet we've suffered the emotional pain of worrying about those fears for events that didn't happen. Even if feared events happen, the actual emotional pain from them is enough. We don't need to add more by worrying. 
It is good to save, it's good to plan, but don't worry about it. Let's look at verse 33 to see Jesus' primary instruction on winning the war against worry. This verse, we read these sections and we think, don't worry. But more than leaving today thinking, don't worry, I want you to think of this. Seek God's kingdom first. This is what it says, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Seek first the kingdom of God. So winning the battle against worry, if we summed it up, it's just pursue God's priorities. Pursue God's priorities. Seeking God's kingdom first. His kingdom is this this thing that we ought to desire to participate in. It's his family. His kingdom community is very personal. It's family. It's to participate in inviting others into this community of God's family. It's proclaiming the good news that we can be saved from the death our sins have earned us. It is to store up treasures in heaven, doing what pleases God by obeying his wishes on earth, by caring about what he cares about, forgiving others as we have been forgiven by him. But don't neglect seeking his righteousness also. Notice it's in there. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness to honor what God determines as righteous. A righteousness, by the way, earlier in this sermon, Jesus said, is got to be greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees as he's revealed the heart of God and the laws that he has given us. He, he wants us to pursue his idea of righteousness, what he prioritizes. Are we committed to acting in ways that honor even the heart of his laws? Not just the outward external meaning, but are we honoring the heart? Are we confessing and correcting, repenting, turning back to the Lord when we err? And you know, don't you love the promise? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Like I, all that, I'm gonna provide that. Don't even worry about that. It's not a, don't be concerned about that. But instead of worrying, sometimes we have to replace that, right? Because if our mind is occupied with worry on a regular basis, if we really wanna fight that, we're gonna probably have to replace that thinking with something else. So now our thinking can be, how do I seek God's kingdom? How do I pursue his priority here? How do I do that in every aspect of my life? Every decision that I make? All these things will be provided to you. These basic necessities of food, drink, and clothing will be provided. We don't have to worry because we have a God big enough to meet every need. To carry us safely through this life and to carry us safely through this thing we call death. We don't have anything to fear. That idea of first Seeking first means priority. Before anything else gets priority, he gets priority. Do we consider our investments, our purchases, our expenses in light of putting God's kingdom first and as the highest priority? How about our plans for our future activities? Our employment, where we're going to work, our retirement, even our geographical location or neighborhood, are we Asking God, how can you use me here? Where do you want me to be so you can use me, so I can prioritize your kingdom, your righteousness? Things like that, all kinds of things need to be filtered through this question. But to seek something is to make every effort to achieve a goal, achieve a target. If you lost something important, how much effort do you put into finding it? It's like that. Have we lost our vision of God's kingdom? lost sight of of how good God is, maybe we need to seek it until we find it again. And sometimes it means to obtain something that wasn't necessarily lost in the first place. We we didn't attain it and lost it and need to get it back, but we, we just need to attain it. Are you striving to obtain a deeper knowledge of God, a true knowledge of God from his word? Are we striving to serve his kingdom and bring others into the kingdom or to play a part in growing others up in their faith? Look, if we've settled that Jesus is our master, 
then let's serve him single-mindedly. Let's serve him as we seek his priorities first. Trusting him every step of the way. And let's kiss worry goodbye. Worry, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us this morning and the challenge to not worry. But God, I also thank you that you don't just tell us not to worry and kind of leave us to fend for ourselves, but you show your heart for us, that you do care about us and will meet our needs and will carry us through even difficulties. God, help us to understand that well and to to embrace you, our good God, who gave your son, Jesus, to die on a cross. If you wouldn't hold back your son, what, what good thing would you withhold from us? God, I, I know that worry is a difficult thing for many of us. But I know I am subject, or not subject, but Lord, I, I give in to this worry sometimes. Forgive me of that sin of worry. Draw me, draw us as your people into being people that trust you by faith and seek your priorities first, your kingdom, your righteousness. Help us, Father. Thank you for your grace for the number of times that we've screwed that up. Thank you, Lord, for your deep love for us. We, we lift our prayer up to you in the name of Jesus, the one who spoke these words, who's alive today at your right hand. It's in his name we pray, amen.